What's doing, everybody? Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. I'm Alec Lace, and before I hit you with today's interview, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the link in the description so you can listen to all of the interviews I've done with so many tremendous dads, including Dana White, Deion Sanders, Tony Hawk, and so many others. Now let's get going with today's interview. Joining me now, a First Class Father, Tyler Hilton. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. Man, thank you. That's weird to say, hear you say the F word about me. It's all so new. It's crazy that I'm somebody's father. That's wild. Well, let's kick it off right there. How many kids do you have and how old are they? Oh, I just have my first daughter. She's uh, uh, three months old. I think she's 15 weeks and was just born at the end of December. And, um, you know, we're just kind of like figuring it out day by day still. It's been great you know um, and luckily for us this whole quarantine thing worked out because i put out a record last january toured all year to promote it and i asked my wife i was like you want me to be home during the pregnancy i'd love to be there take care of you all this stuff and she was like no honestly i can't work so get out there and like work your ass off so we can take some time off when the baby comes so i just toured all last year and we were kind of ready starting january let's just take off and be with the kid so this quarantine thing hasn't hit us too hard um, but God, I just keep thinking about how lucky I was and how it just missed me. You know, if this had been last year and I wasn't able to put out the record or tour, you know, or, or whatever, you know, just the timing worked out great, but I, you know, as a close one. And so it's been nice for us. Yeah. Very cool. Did you guys uh, know what you were having or did you do some kind of gender reveal to figure it out beforehand? No, we just didn't know till it came out. Wow. Literally when she came out, my wife wanted to keep it a surprise and, so, uh, and I would have gone, I probably would have found out. I didn't, you know, just cause I would have been too curious if it was up to me, but I didn't really care. And she really wanted to wait. So, and I'm so glad we did. It was so exciting, but man, by the time the baby came out, I'd been so nervous during the labor about her and about all this stuff going down and just, you know, a kid in general coming out. I didn't even really think about the gender. The doctor was like, what is it, dad? And kept holding it up. And I was like, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't see anything. There's goo. And it looks like you just pulled the stomach out of my wife. It doesn't even look like a human being, you know? And they're like, it's a girl. And I was just, you know, just so crazy that I was just, honestly, you hear people say this and you're like, come on. But I was so happy that she was healthy. My wife was healthy. The baby came out, you know, it was just like, wow. Well, seeing it up close, you're like, this whole process is a miracle. It's amazing. Yeah, right on with that. Now, uh, you, you guys uh, planning on having any more, or that's going to hold off for a while? What's the you, you, you going to try to add a boy to the mix here sooner or later? Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure everyone can relate to this, but um, my spouse and I were, you know, totally different places before the baby came. You know, I was like, we got to have 10 kids. This is the vibe, you know, and my wife's like, well, let's start with one. Now that she's been born, my wife's like, we're having 10 kids. And I'm like, you know what? We got one. Let's try to do this really well. But we're definitely stoked to have more, which I didn't think we would be saying so soon, but we're really into it. Yeah. Awesome to hear that. If you could, Tyler, just take a minute here, please, to hit my listeners with a little bit about your background and what you do. Yeah. Okay. So uh, my name's uh, Tyler Hilton and um, I'm an actor and a singer. I've uh, been you know, a musician my whole life. My family uh, are all musicians um, and, uh, you know, grew up playing with, uh, uh, you know, Fleetwood Mac, George Harrison, my family did. They, they you know, played a lot with them and that whole scene. Um, and uh, I was just kind of lucky to start music really early on with them. They, um, you know, recorded my first album when I was 15. Um, and then I got discovered by these radio DJs in LA when I was like uh, 14 or 15. And um, been kind of just touring and playing music ever since. I'm 36 now. Um, and then somewhere along the way, I got real lucky and, uh, you know, got cast as a bunch of musicians and movies and TV shows. And then that led to like a, you know, an acting career, which truthfully on the side, I was always really into theater. I was always like a theater kid in school. I just thought it was going to be a hobby and not, you know, it felt like what my family did is we play music, not necessarily actors, but um, I loved being in plays and stuff. So um, when I was able to be in movies and TV shows, I just couldn't believe it. I felt like the luckiest dude in the world. So I keep doing it whenever I get the opportunity. Um, I do probably like a movie or a TV show, like at least every year in between touring. And, you know, it's like, there's no guarantee or security in it, but it has been, it's been great so far. And I feel really lucky. So in the meantime, I just keep putting out records and touring and stuff. So. Yeah, and you know what? You, you've been so busy with your career, with the music and the, and the acting. 
I know you're early into the game here yet, but so far, how has becoming a dad kind of changed your perspective on life? You know, it didn't change my perspective when she came out as much. I guess when I, we found out we were pregnant, I, I guess the thing is I was always so, I looked at fatherhood with so much like respect and so much like nervousness. And I've always in the back of my head been like, when I'm a dad, I'm gonna do this. When I'm, it's kind of been the most important thing I knew I was going to do in my life. So I've kind of tripped out on it my entire life. And so like the moment it was going to happen was always going to be a huge deal for me. And kind of like a lot of other things in my life, when the moment actually happened, it was a lot less scary or life changing than I thought I think because I had tripped out on it so much beforehand. So when we found out we were pregnant, I went hard into all the books. I was like, this is it. This is go time. You know, that's a green light. It's dad time, you know? And I, I just got really into it. And when, and I, the whole time I just kept thinking, how am I going to tour? You know, but I've always been thinking that in the back of my head, at some point I'm going to have a kid. How is this going to work this whole touring life and musician life with a kid? At some point I'm going to have a kid. How is being on set going to work? And talking to different actors or musicians I knew on the road that had kids, I was always asking advice because I knew this was the end game to do this. Um, so when the kid came, there wasn't that big of a change. If anything, I'm surprised how relaxed I am. And I think it's just because I was thinking about it so much, but I loved reading all the books. I loved learning about what babies do, what infants do, all the nitty gritty about it. And now I'm just starting to hit this phase with her where I feel like in the beginning, it seems like, well, you probably know way better than I do, but in the beginning, it seems like a lot of infants are the same as they start getting older, you start to get more, um, they become more individual, you know? So the books were really helpful those two, first two or three weeks. That was like hell week for me, you know? I don't know if you ever played football, but friggin' hell week was the worst in high school. They get you in shape in the summer. And then now we're just kind of taking our cues from her and it's been great. You know, she's sleeping really well. And it's, and the big thing I was thinking too, is what are my wife and I going to do with like Instagram with our fans? Are we going to tell them about the baby? What, you know, how are we going to square that? And we just kind of decided to keep it a secret the whole time she was pregnant, just in case, you know, I, I was just so nervous about the whole thing. And then we even waited a couple months after the baby was born till we posted about it. Um, and now it's just great. Like my fans are stoked about it. It's, it feels like a real cohesive situation. You know, it wasn't like one of those things where people are like, Oh, he's a dad. That's a downer. Or I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's just all these things you kind of like freak out about, but everyone was super stoked. So it's cool. Yeah. That's very cool. What was that? Uh, what was that first ride home from the hospital? Like the first time you had to drive home with the, with the baby in the car, what was that like for you? Dude, it's almost <laughs> like my wife called you and told you to ask that question. I was so nervous to drive home from the hospital that I started to get like a little faint and lightheaded and I had to lay down on her hospital bed. She was kind of up and about. And so my dad was there and he took a picture of me like drinking a juice box in the hospital room because I was so nervous I could barely stand. So they finally like helped me up and I'm like, okay, we're going to drive home from, meanwhile, I didn't give birth or anything. I'm just, my wife's up walking around. I'm just nervous about driving. I told my dad, I was like, can you please follow me all the way home just in case I get, you know, nervous and feel like I need to pass out and pull over. Like I was that nervous. So my dad, you know, <laughs> followed me all the way back to my house and the whole, you know, and I, we gave birth in LA. We live in the Valley. The hospital was in Beverly Hills. So I'm driving from Beverly Hills to the Valley in LA and LA traffic. And I'm just like, <sighs> I don't think I've ever squeezed the handlebars so hard in my life. It was very nerve wracking, but we made it. <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, that, that was probably the craziest ride of my life, though, for sure. Yeah, and you know what? Uh, getting into what you do now for a career, with your music career, there's a, you know, a lot of – I think uh, the way into the music industry has changed certainly a lot uh, over the years here, uh, especially the way that we consume music now is far different than it was when I was a kid. Uh, what, kind, what, what kind of advice do you have for the parents out there that have kids that are interested in pursuing a career in music? Um, how old are you, if you don't mind me asking? I'm 39. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, yeah. So like we're around the same age. Yeah. So much stuff has changed from when I got into it in like 1999 or so until now. It's just like, it feels like every five years or so the music business gets this crazy music disruption or this business disruption more so than any other industry. I think, you know, I was recording before when we were still recording to tape, you know, um, before Pro Tools or any kind of computer stuff was a big deal. My first record was really expensive to make for that reason, you know. Um, 
it's just crazy. And then not to mention, I think my first record came out just when iTunes was coming out. So that was a huge, just like, well, the record companies didn't know what was going on. It was all so confusing for everybody. Anyway, whatever, Spotify, blah, 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 it goes on and on. But, um, you know, I think it's never been easier to make music and put it out there. It's never been harder, though, to make money at it. Um, and so I feel like if somebody wants to make music, I think you should put out as many songs as you can on SoundCloud. And if you want to, throw them up on Spotify. You could do that by getting an account on this site called TuneCore. And they'll help there uh, for a little bit of dough. They'll put your music on iTunes and Spotify and all that stuff. Um, but, you know, making it is kind of like the, the harder part, putting it out's not that hard. Um, you know, you can get like logic or garage band and kind of make it at home, but I feel like it's important for people to just keep putting it out there and trying things. Um, because now I don't think you can be too precious with it. I don't think you wait and like wait for your 10 best songs and then put them out. I mean, maybe someone will disagree with me and I understand that too. And at some point that was the vibe, but now it's like, just put it out there see what the audience reacts to. I can't tell you how many people um, I know, and I relate to this too, you put out 10 songs and you think you know which one everyone's gonna like and you don't. Um, they end up streaming a different one. So the point is just put it out there and see what people respond to, you know? Um, and yeah. even touring, you know, like it's changed now that we're in this quarantine vibe. Like I was gonna start a couple tour dates next week and um, my wife and I are figuring out before quarantine went down, like how we were gonna, manage that as i went and played some shows I'm, instead of touring i'm just gonna do instagram lives uh, i'm gonna start them next week every friday night and um the other thing this whole thing's inspired me to do is i really want to do a kid's record i've been wanting to do one for a while now even before we had a daughter and i'm gonna start doing um children's sing-alongs for 30 minutes every sunday now on my instagram account too because a lot of my fans have kids too so it's just interesting like the kid and the quarantine has kind of changed everything but you know, you can keep streaming and keep putting out music, you know? Yeah, very cool. And on that, uh, what does your bedtime routine look like so far with your daughter? Do you sing uh, uh, like you're a lullaby guy when you're putting her down to sleep? How has the bedtime routine kind of worked out so far? No, not yet. You know, I tried it, of course. I had this, like, these, you know, images of me singing to her every night and all this stuff. And, of course, reality is so much messier. It involves <laughs> a lot more throw up and poop and just, like, you know – uh, you know, before we had the kid, too, my wife and I were reading all these books, and we're like, okay, we're definitely going to be the kind of parent right from day one. You know, you cry it out. You put yourself to sleep. You got to become independent as soon as you do it. No shaking them until they go to bed. They just learn how to – now I'm on the ball every night. I'm doing the whole thing. I like anything to get her to sleep. Um, but, uh, yeah, our bedtime routine now is pretty much just, you know, feeding her and praying to God that she goes down soon. And she's been good about it, so. Yeah, very cool. And uh, are you are you able to help at all with the feeding? Is your wife doing the breastfeeding or are you guys doing the formula? Yeah, she's doing the breastfeeding. And, you know, I, I keep saying like, hey, if you want to throw the formula in there, like, I'm, you know, just do what you can. We have a lot of friends that kind of like had a lot of pressure put on them to do breastfeeding by from their mothers or whatever. And it seems really sad and really tough and a lot of pressure on girls. I didn't realize how tough uh, breastfeeding is until um, I watched the first couple of weeks go down, but she has been a trooper and it, now we're full on breastfeeding. Um, but we got the formula just in case, you know, things go dry, but we're, it's been good so far. Yeah. It's always cheaper when you can get them to drink from the tap, you know, but uh, it, it's definitely yes. one of those things where it, I, it definitely weighs on women, especially if they, if it, they, the kid doesn't latch on right. And they're having trouble with the, with the milk coming in. It's like, it makes them feel like they're doing something wrong. So I think that's where it creates that, and there is so much pressure for the breast. I mean, it is uh, the best way to do it, but I mean, it's uh, it, it's there. There's a lot of pressure on them to come through with that. So I know that can get tricky, especially with the first child. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you know, yeah. And, and we didn't know, like I said, the first child's so crazy because you don't know, especially for girls, because you don't know at all how your body's going to react. Was it different for your wife? Like after the first one, did she kind of react the same for the next three physically? Uh, e each one, she went uh, deeper and deeper as far as like breastfeeding and stuff like that. And even because my wife had C-sections for all four of our kids. Uh, they were all high risk pregnancies and everything. So, um, but e each one, she went, uh, you know, a, a little bit deeper, like with our first one, maybe three months breastfeeding, the next one, like eight months breastfeeding. And then like, it just kept getting a little bit more and more each time, you know? Oh, so, wow. uh, and plus e each child was totally different in the way that they would go about. We had one kid that would just fall asleep when he was, you know, the minute he started eating. 
One kid was like a barracuda where he was just like, attack it. You know what I mean? So it's like everyone has their own little style of, of how they do it. So each kid is different. So it's, you got to treat them all individually. So, um, you know, you got to find it, find, get into a groove that works. That's all. And then we were doing, you know, the pumping and then storing. And that's where I was able to help out, especially during the night. I mean, I listen, my, my first kid, I had no idea either. I was trying to like, while my wife was sleeping, trying to, stick my kid's head on the breast and try to you know, get a feeding and it didn't work out like you know so you learn these things as you go along yeah no we were trying to be like tag team right from the beginning so every time the baby woke up in the middle of the night we would both get up and she would usually feed and i'd do the diaper change and we put it down and we try to get the the system going but we're uh we're that, that's cool to hear that's really cool to hear actually yeah, it's definitely, a, you know, an on-the-job training. It's something that, even like you said, you've driven a car a thousand times in your life, uh, and then the minute that you're going to do it, all of a sudden it has this different tone to it. So everything, I think that's what happens through a lot of things. We start, you know, putting others ahead of ourselves automatically once we become a dad. So it definitely changes yeah. that dynamic. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, too, because I was thinking that uh, there's been this whole, like, expansion of selfless love with her. You know, I, I, I really, like, I thought I was going to be more like, oh, I just want to like kiss you all the time. I just want to like, I mean, which I do probably more than I should. I feel like she gets a little annoyed at me, but you know, I, I find myself so much wanting to be, uh, wanting her to be happy or wanting her to be, you know what I mean? Like I, I have this weird instinct all of a sudden to be like, I don't want to dress you up in crazy clothes and make you take all these like pictures or, you know, when you get a little older, like gel your hair and put your hair in pony. I don't know. I just feel like I just want you to be like happy and relaxed. You know, it's just the weirdest thing. It's such a selfless love. Um, I really don't want to make her like an extension of me. Um, I've, I've seen people do it and I feel like for her, I think it would just be great to like make it about like where her vibe is at, I guess. I don't know, which I didn't expect to feel that way. Yeah. And you know, I, I bring a ton of military guys on the podcast here and it's like one of the things they have, kind of built into them the military men and women they have that service before self type of mentality uh built into them as they go through the training and stuff like that but the first time i think as a civilian as a, as a guy that you get that um much more so than when you get married is, is when you have your first kid you get that actual realization of putting somebody else's needs uh really ahead of yours it did for me anyway for the first time in my life where i felt that wow. that, that type of feeling you know dude that is really really cool uh I didn't realize that. That's amazing. I could totally see that with military folks. And it's a cool for my wife and I, she's an actress and I'm a musician and we try to be conscious of it, but everything is about us. You know, like the product we're selling is us. What we talk about on the phone is like us to our team or whatever, you know, it's all about like, and so it's nice to have these things where you can kind of get out of it, you know, really cool. That's amazing. Yeah. And you know what, you, you've had so much success here. What, what type of uh, or plans or goals do you have here for yourself for the future? This kid's record, I'm really stoked about. I mean, I'm making another Tyler record uh, right now. Um, I've also been working a lot with uh, Billy Ray Cyrus. We've been producing and writing his new record with a friend of mine. Um, and he's kind of an old friend of ours. So that's a little bit on hold now that we've all had to go into lockdown. Um, but the kid's record and the Tyler record, I'm going to keep working on right here in the RV. What I do is I record my parts here with my microphone set up. I got these two mics here. And then I email the tracks to uh, the guy who my producing partner in LA and he kind of like fits it all together. So I'm going to keep trying to move forward on that. Um, and uh, that's, you know, just take it a day at a time. Really try to get these live stream things going online, try to get a regular hang so I can keep playing live music for the fans. Um, but this is just, you know, it's scary, this whole thing, but a little bit exciting because it's, I kind of get excited when I have to like scrap everything and rework a whole different system. So I don't know, we'll figure it out, you know? Yeah, I, I think uh, it's making a lot of us reevaluate the way we, we go about our daily life. And we that certainly, uh, we figured out what's more important in, in life. I think a lot of people have come to that realization, like we come back down to, and, and hopefully it's bringing a lot of more families uh, closer together, uh, you know, during this time. That's, that would be my hope for that while we're going oh, through man. this. I hope so too. You know, I want to say too, before we get any farther, or you know, in case we're about to end or whatever, but dude, I heard your episode about sobriety and I want to tell you it, how much that meant to me. I've been sober for five years, maybe six years now. And it was by far the hardest thing I've ever done. It sounded like it was so hard for you when you uh, did that seven month podcast you did. It was, uh, you know, I haven't, Anytime I get to talk to someone that's sober or going through it, it helps me a lot. That's why those meetings always help. But, you know, I haven't done meetings in so long. 
So just hearing that was such a boost for me. I just can't even tell you. And I know they, t they tell you that in meetings and you hear people say, oh, when you share your story, it helps others. It never seems like that would be the case if I were to tell people my story. But hearing yours, there again, it like just helped me so much. It really did. So thank you for being so um, vulnerable and saying so many things that could potentially be embarrassing or shameful. We all have that shit, you know? So just you saying that was like, whoa, just heavy, very cool. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for that. And you know what? I, I'm at a place right now where I'm no longer in a fight with alcohol anymore. Like I, I used to always battle with it, especially now we have this quarantine. And one of the number one top sellers right now across the country or the world is liquor, you know, where everyone's stocking up on the liquor. And it's like it's not even a, a thing that phases me anymore. And it's uh, yeah, uh, uh, my, my fight, uh, you know, my, my whole uh, dealing with alcohol, it's just Every, everything negative that's ever happened in my life has been a direct result of alcohol or drugs. And it's just been, uh, it took me a long time to learn these lessons and I had to learn them the hard way, but uh, it definitely um, uh, a lot better uh, for it, you know, so. Dude, good for you. And I know like a lot of people don't understand because a lot of people are just like, I don't understand. Just don't drink. Like what's so hard. It's like, this is like the quarantine, just stay home. What's the big deal. But unless you know how big of a deal it is and unless you know what happens to your mind when it starts like, you don't know how hard it is. I, I describe it as like being thirsty or hungry or having to pee. You know, that's the sensation that's like in your body. And when you're hungry, you're hungry. You know, when you have to pee, you have to pee. And like when you have to drink or when you, you have to do it, you know, it's really counterintuitive to like breathe underwater. That's what it feels like to me. It's like open your mouth and breathe. You're underwater. Like that's how uh, counterintuitive felt like to me to say like, no, I'm not going to drink right now or whatever. And, um, just it's just crazy and I, I related to you when you're talking about all those commercials and stuff you saw on tv like it is really a bummer you don't realize how much of a i don't want to be whatever but how much potential problem a lot of people might be hiding or might have until you get out of it and realize how little you need it and how much everyone reaches for it. people that will never think they have a problem but how socially acceptable it is it's crazy yeah it's definitely an illusion you know uh, uh, what it is and I, you know what i drive a lot of uber well not now during the quarantine but I, uh, my side gig is driving uber on the weekends and i oh. always see it's either people that are drunk going to get drunk or talking about how they got drunk. And that's all I drive. And, and every mile I drive of Uber, it drives me farther away from ever going back to another drink. Cause I get the chance to see it uh, yeah. from the outside, looking at it and saying, wow, that was me. You know what I mean? I was this person too. So I don't look down on it. I just, I, I recall who I was when I was going through it. And, I, and it's not the person that uh, I, you know, I'm glad I don't associate with my, with that person anymore, you know? So it's eye opening to see it and, and the devastating effects it has at 2 a.m. when the bars are getting out, so. Um, and you know what? I mean, your kids are so lucky that you nipped it in the bud uh, when they were young and, you know, you went through it now. I mean, if they could have, I don't know, they could have been the way they remembered you and they could have gone all through their childhood. And, you, you know, just the fact that you did it is is so impressive. I just, I can't tell you how impressive that is. And it was cool for me to hear too. It gets, it gets easier, same thing with me. It gets easier, but every once in a while, you just like have that moment where you're like, I'm probably fine. You know what I mean? I'm probably fine. Why don't I just like dip into it? That thought though has scared me so much. I've never gone back. Cause I just know it's my favorite thing in the entire world. It was my absolute favorite thing. I have my favorite feeling, my favorite thing to do. I love the taste. I just loved it, you know, and I could never go back, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. I, I lied to myself that way too. And I, I was sober for almost three years and then slid back into it because I kept telling myself I was okay. I could either just just drink beer or just drink this or just drink on the week. I, I, I kept lying to myself oh, yeah. to try to play with it, you know, and then I, I slid back into it. My best friend killed himself and that slid me back into it. I figured I'll, I'll use it and lean on it just to get through the week of the eulogy and getting through that moment. And, uh, you know, and I, and then it took me forever to get back out of it. So it was like, uh, it, well, once I stopped lying to myself, it made it a lot easier too. Yeah, that's what I thought, too, is I was getting tired of doing the math, too. It felt like every day I was like, okay, I told myself only 14 or maybe 21 drinks a week. Okay, that's an average of three a night. Okay, I had six yesterday. Okay, you know, I was just, like, always doing math in my head. It's just so nice to, like, just make it not an option, you know. Anyway. Yeah, definitely. Right. Yeah, and you know what, to, to wrap this up, my, uh, you know, it's interesting to hear your answer here because, you you know, you're uh, you know just brand new into the game here. But the last thing I want to ask you, I'd love to ask all the dads that I get on the podcast, uh, what type of advice do you have for the new dad or for the about to be dad who's out there listening? Uh, I think, you know, if you can create some time and space mentally and in your schedule to really just be open to whatever's about to happen, um, that would help. Um, my wife and I, probably the thing I'm most appreciative of uh, is that we both had time. We didn't have to work and I could be there to help her. 
um, it's going to be weird and you're not going to get a lot of sleep and yada, yada, yada. But if you can at least both be committed to being there and helping each other out, it's going to help. The other thing I'd really recommend is if you can go ahead and grab an in-law or someone to just be around, that would be, that would, that's really helpful. My mother-in-law was there for a couple months, uh, and then she had to go back to Canada because of the whole quarantine. And for a few weeks there, we were by ourselves and it was, oh, it was tougher. But, um, you know, uh, if you can like read some stuff about like the way babies, you know, behave and what kind of sleep they need and what kind of feed they need, you know, it helps kind of div divvy up the day into little three hour um, cycles, you know, which helps you like get through. That helped me a lot. But um, yeah, that, that'd be the main thing. Yeah, good stuff. I love the message. This has been an honor for me. I got to say, Tyler Hilton, you're a first class father all the way. And thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time here on First Class Fatherhood. Appreciate it. What a cool podcast, dude. I pre thanks for having me on.